Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of improving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material, if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course. Have a good time. Okay, uh, my name is Larry Yates, and uh, this is Lieutenant Colonel Bill Bassett. We're both from the Combat Studies Institute, and uh, this is the lesson on the Cold War. And our purpose here is, uh, one, to provide you some information that's not in the readings, that's to give you a little more depth uh, than the students will have uh, in doing the readings, and uh, also provide you with some perspectives you can use in uh, teaching the class, and uh, some tips on uh, how to go about uh, teaching this particular lesson. Uh, it's uh, not an easy lesson because it's mainly providing context. There's no uh, war to look at, There's, there are no battles to analyze. Uh, mainly it's how did the Cold War come about, how did it develop, and what role did the military play in that, both in terms of nuclear strategy and in terms of the military services themselves. So that's what we'll be looking at, and uh, I'll probably take the lead on the, the first part of that, the origins and development of the Cold War, and then turn it over uh, to Lieutenant Colonel Bassett for nuclear strategy, and then we'll both fight for the last one, uh, the role of the military. So uh, the Cold War, uh, one thing uh, that uh, you probably know yourself, uh, uh, whatever, assuming let's say I'm talking to someone in their mid-30s, uh, you miss most of it. Uh, and uh, your students definitely will have missed most of it. Uh, many of them will have been born, what, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962, or right about that time, maybe a little before. They're not going to remember it. And uh, uh, given the fact that the Cold War started around some say 1947, uh, that's a fairly, fairly good stretch of history that's simply uh, not in their memory bank. Uh, they became aware probably of the Cold War sometime in the 70s or uh, tw uh, toward its last phases in the 80s. But uh, there's a long history there and the Cold War goes through a number of permutations and phases and I just want to go over those briefly. Uh, but uh, before I do, might uh, uh, just suggest to you that to get the discussion started, you might ask the students what they think of when the term Cold War is used and just see what sort of answers you get, not only in terms of their own personal experience, but just what was their concept of the Cold War. Generally, it boils down to something about uh, the free world versus communism, uh, and that's fine, but uh, is, a, is a good general description, but it's somewhat uh, simplistic. And what I hope to do here uh, in a few minutes minutes is to give you a little more detail than that and also a little more detail, a little more interpretation than you get from your reading. So. Uh uh, 
look at the traditional school of thought about it, uh, the Cold War was the U.S. response to communist expansion. Initially Soviet expansion uh, at the end of World War II and in the months and years following that conflict. Uh, we weren't sure what motivated Soviet expansion. There were a number of studies done at the time, uh, the one by Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal, which indicated that it was Russian, or excuse me, communist ideology. World revolution. The Soviet Union was out to take over the world in the name of international communism. Uh, Others argued it was more Russian imperialism. It was a continuation of expansionism that the czars themselves had pursued uh, from the 18th, 19th century on, or even you know, 18th, 19th, 18th and 19th century, perhaps before. But the continual expansion of Russia into uh, an empire and now perhaps uh, uh, throughout Europe, etc. That was another issue. What are the limits of this expansion? Well, if it's ideology, it's worldwide. If it's traditional Russian expansion, it probably will be satisfied with a good chunk of Europe and the Middle East and perhaps part of Asia. But uh, these points were being debated. A third point of view was put forth by what was then uh, one of our for, uh, foremost Russian experts, George F. Kennan, in a, uh, what was at first called a long telegram, a telegram he sent as Chargé d'Affaires in Moscow to Washington in 1946, uh, describing what he saw as the Soviet threat. It was later put in condensed form uh, into an article in Foreign Relations, or excuse me, Foreign Affairs magazine in uh, 1947. It's called the X article because he didn't put his name to it as a government official, uh, but uh, it was called the conduct, or, oh boy. Uh, never mind. We'll, we'll edit that part out if that's all right. But anyway, we'll, uh, uh, Kennan's article on Soviet expansion. Why are the Soviets expansionistic? And his uh, answer was, ideology does play a role, but only in the sense that communist ideology portrays a very threatening world to, uh, <clears throat> to those countries that are communist. It sees the capitalist world as in, uh, inextricably hostile uh, and uh, out to take over or to destroy communism. And so ideology plays a part, not in the sense of world revolution, but in the sense of portraying the world as hostile, a world in which there are two contending forces, uh, the capitalist forces and the forces of socialism slash communism, uh, and uh, it's a battle to the death. So uh, that's the role of ideology. It's not a blueprint for taking over the world. It simply says the world is one of conflict. Kennan's argument is that the source of Soviet conduct, and that's the title of the article. Uh, the source of Soviet conduct is the political system. It's totalitarian. And to maintain their totalitarian system at home, um, they need to expand abroad. Because the main threat to the totalitarian system will be the ideas of freedom, et cetera, seeping into the country and uh, infecting the people and undermining the system. And the way you can prevent that is to continuously push out your borders to where there aren't any ideas uh, that run counter to your own uh, culture and own system uh, that can infect the population. So by that uh, standard, uh, the expansion is uh, unlimited. But Kennan would argue it's limited in the sense that no country can take over the world. Uh, logistically, it's impossible. So there are certain areas the Soviet Union will focus upon, and where those areas overlap with our interests, we need to stand up to them. And that leads to the issue of what is the U.S. response to communist expansion. Kennan came up with the word containment. <laughs> And that is, we will stop them from expanding wherever it's in our interest to do so, hold the line, and then wait for their system to change. Because if the system of totalitarianism is at the root of expansion, or the ideology, if you want to argue that, if changes take place within the Soviet Union that will change that system and doom that ideology, then uh, perhaps their expansion will stop. So we'll hold the line and wait for changes in the Soviet Union. Now, turns out Kennan's piece proved prophetic. That's pretty much what happened. Uh, but it took 40 years to do it, and uh, uh, nobody was contemplating that. Maybe Kennan was, but most people uh, wanted a quicker end to the Cold War. And uh, critics of containment argued this policy of holding the line gave to the other side the initiative of where to hit along that line. And do we really have the resources to defend a line uh, all the way around the Soviet Union, and then after the fall of China in Asia, and, and ultimately around 
around the world. Can we really hold the line? Do we have the resources? Uh, and some argued no, uh, that we should seize the initiative and pursue a policy of rollback and liberation, take areas that have been uh, uh, taken over by the uh, Russians or later the Chinese, whatever, and push them back, push the Russians out of Eastern Europe, push them out of the Baltic states, etc. So there are contending schools, number one, of what motivates Soviet expansion, two, what are the limits of Soviet expansion, and three, what should the, should the U.S. do about it? Of these contending schools, the ones that pretty much win out are, one, ex why are they expansionistic? World revolution. Most of us grew up believing it was world revolution that motivated the Soviet Union. I don't believe it anymore, but at the time it seemed a compelling argument. Uh, what's the response? We were happy with containment because we realized in the 50s that to pursue liberation risked World War III, and once the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons after 1949, uh, uh, that was too high a risk to run for uh, a policy of liberation. It also made our allies very, very nervous. When we started talking about liberating Eastern Europe, Western Europe got very nervous. Uh, this came out during the 1952 presidential campaign when uh, <clears throat> Eisenhower put forward the idea of liberation as a trial balloon. Uh, the uproar caused him to pull back from it, and you heard very little about it after that. So ideologically motivated expansion, uh, again, a simplistic idea, but one that took hold. Containment as our response to it. <clears throat> And then the Cold War would go through a number of phases in terms of how we applied the strategies of containment, to use a phrase that uh, John Lewis Gaddis has, uh, uh, and I'll get to that in just a bit. Now, that's the traditional or orthodox school. There's one other, it needs to be mentioned, the revisionist school that uh, existed before the Vietnam War, but came into its own during Vietnam and has persisted since because it did raise some good points, although many of uh, its more extreme points have been shot down. The revisionists would argue that the U.S. is responsible for the Cold War, that uh, the Soviet Union may have a universal ideology, but so does the United States. We think of uh, freedom and democracy as applicable throughout the world, and we've done our part to extend it, just as we have our economic system of capitalism. So who's universalistic? Both sides were. We were in a position to be more aggressive, however, after World War II, and as a result, we caused great concern within the Soviet Union, who uh, where Stalin was looking out for Soviet security concerns vis-a-vis uh, -vis Western Europe. In other words, a revived Germany could come and do what Germany had done twice already in the 20th century. It could march across an open plain right into Russia. And also Napoleon had done it in the 19th century. There's no natural barrier there to stop them. So some revisionists would argue Stalin's main <clears throat> concern was to get that barrier. If there's not a natural barrier, he'd create a political one by satellitizing or at least establishing as spheres of influence the Baltic states, Poland, Eastern Europe, the Balkans. Uh, and that would be his buffer, having friendly governments there and then as time goes by the satellitization of those countries and the presence uh, in all but uh, Yugoslavia and Albania of the Red Army. Um, <clears throat> So the revisionist uh, version is uh, we're the ones that are aggressive and the Soviet Union is more defensive oriented and uh, we provoke them, they have to respond and thus the Cold War. Uh, with the end of the Cold War, Soviet archives have opened up and we see that uh, the revisionists have some points. So we, the United States certainly had a universal ideology. We were certainly aggressive in pursuing it, but uh, uh, the Soviet Union bears much of the responsibility for the Cold War. Stalin was looking for opportunities to expand and did. Um, so those are the uh, certain interpretations that give a little more uh, uh, depth and perspective to the lesson than uh, what you would get out of Addington and Wigley alone. Uh, the Cold War, as I said, developed through certain phases. Um, we can look at this in a number of ways, and I'll, I'll do this very quickly, or, or as quickly as I can. Uh, one would be to look at how containment was applied. And uh, this relies on uh, 
to some extent on John Lewis Gaddis's uh, strategies of containment, which is uh, out in book form. There's an article he wrote uh, uh, with that title for National Security Journal, and uh, there's also a short version that we use for one of our supplemental readings. If you would like that, uh, give us a call and we will mail you copies. I think I can say that. Somebody's going to have to do it, not me. But uh, 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 give uh, Sam Lewis or Jim Martin a call. They'll be happy to mail you a copy of uh, John Gaddis's article, Strategies of Containment. Uh, I'll go over it very briefly here in, in some respects. But uh, uh, looking at uh, U.S.-Soviet relations before World War II, generally they were hostile. Uh, we, uh, at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, the United States did interve intervene militarily in Russia during their civil war. Uh, we, the British, uh, the French, other countries were in intervened in that conflict, uh, which we ended up, uh, we pulled our troops out, the Bolsheviks won, uh, but our intervention left a lasting animosity. Uh, we refused to recognize the Soviet Union until 1933 uh, during the Great Depression when we were looking for markets. Uh, prior to that time, we kept uh, the Soviet Union uh, at arm's length. We treated it as a pariah. Uh, not every European country did. The Soviet Union did join the League of Nations, uh, whereas, of course, we did not. But we did not recognize them. Uh, between 1917 and 1933, we had, did not have diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, in the 30s, with the rise of Hitler, uh, uh, the, the, the Soviet Union ultimately allies itself with, with Hitler. You have the invasion of Poland. And then with the invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, we become friends with uh, Stalin. Uh, the dictator Stalin becomes Uncle Joe. And uh, we're going to give him the support, uh, any support we can, mainly in the form of Lend-Lease, to keep uh, the Russian war effort going. And then after Pearl Harbor, we're uh, informal allies. There's not a formal alliance alliance, but uh, a coalition. Uh, during the war, President Roosevelt hoped that once the war was over, the, the Soviet Union and the United States would cooperate for world peace. And he believed that this was possible because uh, his argument was what motivated Stalin was the way we had treated Russia in the past. Uh, Russia was a malign giant. And if Roosevelt could convince Stalin that uh, relations with the West could be good, uh, that Stalin would come around and cooperate operate and, and work with us for world peace. Uh, Roosevelt died in April 1945. At the time, the Soviet Union has uh, overrun Poland, Eastern Europe. And uh, uh, the question is, what kind of governments will these countries have? Will Stalin impose communist-led governments? Uh, there are indications that he will. He's not allowing free elections in most of these countries. And uh, when Harry Truman becomes president on Roosevelt's death, there are many advisors who go to him and say Roosevelt had it wrong. Russia is not a malign giant. It's a world bully. It will strike out. It will expand wherever it can unless you stop it. And um, if you stand up to it, however, uh, the Soviet Union will cooperate. But first you have to stand firm. And Truman does. Uh, throughout 45, 46, there are a number of uh, issues on which the United States, States takes a tough stand. But it doesn't stop the Soviets. Uh, they continue to push their advantage in Eastern Europe and uh, try to uh, go into the Near East. And uh, this leads to a reevaluation with the studies I mentioned previously. What are they after? Uh, debate over that. But the bottom line was they are expansionistic. They're not going to cooperate. They're our rival. They're our opponent, maybe even our enemy. And containment was a response to that. Initially, containment uh, from 47 to 49 is implemented in Europe with the Truman Doctrine of 47, A degrees in Turkey. Uh, where we saw a communist threat. Uh, there was a civil war in Greece. The communists being on one side, we will help the other side. In Turkey, there was pressure on Turkey to give up a couple provinces to the Soviet Union and to share the control of the uh, 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 straits into the uh, Black Sea and the Mediterranean. This, or into the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, we gave support to Turkey to uh, stave off this Soviet pressure. Then the Mar Marshall Plan of 1940, 
1948, uh, which is economic assistance to Western Europe in general, to get it on its feet, and then NATO, which originates in uh, 48, and the treaty is signed in 49, we're committed to the military defense of Western Europe. So by 1949, containment uh, has been extended to Western Europe. The line is fairly clearly drawn, one exception, Berlin, which is on their side of the line. We have an enclave there. But aside from that, the line is fairly clearly drawn. In 50 and fi uh, from 50 to 53, 54, containment is expanded or extended to Asia. After the fall of China, the war in Korea, uh, we're in the process already at that point of getting a treaty with Japan. By the end of the war in Korea and the following year, 1954, we have alliances, actual alliances now, with South Korea, Taiwan, or previously Formosa, Taiwan, uh, the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, did I mention Japan? Uh, and then in 54, the Southeast uh, Asian Treaty Organization, CETA, which become, become controversial in Vietnam. So containment has extended to the Far East. And then in the mid-50s, with the rise of Nasser and, uh, in Egypt, and pan-Arabism and Arab uh, radicalism, and the attempt of the Soviet Union to take advantage of that, containment is extended to the Middle East as well. And what you, you see is the gradual extend, uh, extension of containment into a global policy. Policy. Um, and so you can look at the Cold War in terms of the phases of uh, containment. Um, you can look at it in terms of the arenas being fought over uh, from 47 to 53, it's the Eurasian landmass, and after that, it's the third world. In the mid 50s, uh, the communist uh, states mainly, or the communist leaders mainly, uh, the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China begin to uh, try to gain influence, uh, uh, if not uh, dictatorial control of, at least influence in many of the underdeveloped and anti colonial countries of the emerging third world. And this causes us great concern. You can't stop that militarily. It's an economic and ideological approach. Uh, military barriers won't help. So that, uh, and from 55, really, or the mid 50s and into the 80s to the end of the Cold War, that's really the arena of the Cold War, the third world, the periphery, not the Eurasian, Eurasian landmass. That's pretty well taken care of. Uh, there are a few Berlin crises, but that's wrapped up under Nixon. We reach an agreement. Uh, an accord over Berlin. So uh, the fighting's gonna be, or the, the struggle rather, will be on the periphery. You can look at it in that way. The intensity of the Cold War is another way to divide it. Uh, from 48 to 62, every year you've got a war scare, beginning with the Berlin blockade, ending with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, I grew up, uh, when I was a kid, every year there was a threat of a nuclear confrontation. That's a heck of a way to grow up. Uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, that drops off precipitously. There's more negotiation. There's certainly conflict, but we start dealing more and more with the Soviet Union, detente, under, uh, begins under Johnson, Nixon really accelerates it, becomes a dirty word under Ford because of what the Soviets are doing in the Horn of Africa and Afghanistan, but we are working with the Soviet Union. Uh, recognition of the People's Republic of China, the Cold War is maturing. The rhetoric of the 50s and early 60s is going by the boards. The view of the, uh, the communist world is monolithic, that's passing by the boards. Uh, uh, so in terms of intensity, another is uh, simply the change in perspective from Soviet expansion to international communist expansion. In that, Vietnam is the watershed. Uh, and for much of the Cold War, it is. Uh, uh, going into Vietnam, we have the view of communism as largely monolithic, not entirely, we don't, we don't see it that simplistically, but it's fairly close. Coming out of Vietnam, our view of the enemy is much more sophisticated and much more complex. It took Vietnam to change that. Uh, but also the bipartisanship that backed up much of our uh, Cold War policy prior to Vietnam evaporates with Vietnam. After Vietnam, uh, our foreign policy uh, is based more upon ad hoc support for any given issue, which you may or may not get. In Central America, you don't get it, uh, but you do it anyway. Uh, in other cases, the Maya guess, some incidents, you do get uh, bipartisan support. And then uh, strategies of containment, as I mentioned, John Gaddis, I'll let you get the article for that. It uh, talks about the changes between symmetrical and asymmetrical symmetrical containment. But uh, these are different ways you can look at the Cold War. Again, it's, it's an ongoing process. It's an evolutionary process, one of development, not a static us versus them, uh, 
uh, commie revolutionaries versus uh, freedom fighters in the West. That's all good rhetoric, and it was used up into the Reagan administration, but then take a look at what Reagan ends up doing, uh, coming to terms with the Soviet Union as uh, it's uh, entering its what death throes as the Soviet Union. But uh, uh, the rhetoric has been toned down, et cetera. So that's, that's a very, very, very brief overview of the Cold War. There are a lot of issues here that we don't have time to get into, but again, for the purpose of your students, uh, it's mainly to provide context for the military issues that will come out of it. Uh, the first of which is the Cold War coincides with the advent of the atomic age, and what uh, our, uh, what role will the bomb play? And for that, uh, Colonel Bassett will take over. Can I just so. say before um, before addressing nuclear strategy, uh, just uh, possibly suggesting a question or a way to. Um, uh, to move the student discussion into origins and characteristics of the Cold War. Um, Larry offered one, uh, when you, uh, when we say or hear the word uh, or the characterization Cold War, what does it mean? Another one I use with my students is, uh, how do we explain the rapid post-war change in U.S.-U.S.S.R. relations from uneasy partners during World War II uh, to implacable foes locked in a 45-year Cold War? Um, how do we arrive at that uh, change, a way of getting into it, uh, and then emphasizing to the students during this discussion that what you're doing in, in what should probably be uh, no more than the first 30 minutes of a two-hour lesson, as Larry has said, you're setting the uh, political, economic, uh, diplomatic, and social context uh, for much of the military strategy, policy, and uh, uh, strategic decisions that are being made in not only uh, the next lesson on Korea, uh, but really through the remainder of the, uh, of the course to the second to last lesson. So I just, um, I just offer that to you. The, the section on American uh, military strategy in the nuclear age is, um, uh, I find very difficult. I'm a, uh, a 19th century American military uh, guy. My focus is on the uh, Civil War. I find uh, much of, uh, of this material to be uh, confusing, almost uh, surreal in, a, in the logic being employed and, and the whole uh, evolution of uh, nuclear strategy. Um, I don't think that the reading, uh, I think the reading by Lawrence Friedman in Makers of Modern Strategy is one of the more difficult readings we expose the students to in, um, uh, in the evolution of modern war. Uh, but having said that, I, I might suggest to you uh, maybe four major points that you want to explore with, um, uh, with your students as you talk about, the, um, about nuclear strategy. Um, the first is to uh, look at the whole notion of revolutionary change in American strategy. Uh, and along these lines, I think a good way to do that, a good technique to use not just in this lesson but others, uh, is to pull a quote from uh, one of the student readings, in this case, Russell Wigley's American Way of War, uh, and just read it. Say, Wigley uh, asserts in American Way of War that the atomic bomb represented a strategic revolution. Uh, strategy would have to be redefined. That's really the thesis of, his, uh, of this essay that uh, the students read. Uh, pose that, restate it, and then ask the students what they think of it. Do they agree with Wigley that the advent of nuclear weapons in the context of this growing uh, uh, Cold War with the Soviet Union fundamentally redefines uh, U.S. strategic, uh, uh, U.S. strategy making and strategic calculations. Uh, that's good for um, a good uh, five to ten minutes of discussion. I think the other thing you, um, you might want to do in this block is look at the inherent difficulties uh, and maybe some of the general characteristics of um, framing military strategy in the nuclear age. Uh, and along these lines, another technique, maybe a pedagogical technique that I'd suggest to you, uh, one in addition to using an author's uh, quotation, a quotation from an author, is to throw a slide on the, uh, on the screen behind you uh, with a, uh, a nice pithy quote from a contemporary um, uh, participant and then ask them uh, what they think this means or uh, use that as a means of generating discussion. Uh, and I think there are three that I've identified and used in my lesson here in the college. 
Uh, the first being a quote from Harry Truman in 1949, where he asks, can the Russians do it? And the response is, yes, they can. So Truman responds, in that case, we have no choice. And I think what that speaks to is the, uh, is the escalation or the tendency toward escalation uh, in the development of nuclear weaponry and the uh, strategic uh, formulation. Uh, the whole idea of achieving superiority in numbers, uh, delivery capabilities, uh, or and or the flexible application of uh, capabilities developed. Uh, another great quote, one from Bernard Brody, one of the foremost strategic thinkers in the late 1950s and early 60s. He says, and I quote, it should be obvious that what counts in basic deterrence is not so much the size and efficiency of one striking force before it is hit as the size and condition to which the enemy thinks he can reduce it by a surprise attack, as well as his confidence in the correctness of his predictions. Great quote. It gets it at many different issues associated with uh, nuclear strategy. Um, Thomas Schelling writes about the reciprocal fear of a surprise attack. And Friedman talks about this in his essay, how that is destabilizing, uh, and that it is this fear of a surprise attack that uh, must be overcome if you are to achieve deterrence based on uh, stability. I think it's also a way to explore the distinction between, Brody's quote is a way of exploring the distinction between first and second strike, strike capabilities. What the difference between the two is and how second strike and the perceived possession of a second strike capability is crucial to a nation's um, confidence uh, in, a, um, in its uh, strategic well-being. Uh, finally, I think it gets to the, the absolutely crucial point that uh, enemy perception is, is important. That what you're doing in much of your uh, stra strategic development, capabilities development, uh, is attempting to influence uh, the thinking, the perceptions of your enemy. Um, you know, the classic term perception is reality. Well, your enemy will operate on perceptions, uh, and you may possess a capability, and that's a good thing, uh, but it's crucial that your enemy perceive it in a way that, uh, that you think necessary to attain the uh, deterrence effect. Uh, and then finally, a slide uh, we get a lot of mileage out of. I mean, it has the an Alice uh, looking through the looking glass uh, quality to it, uh, so representative of some of this strategic thinking and writing during this period. And I quote, he thinks we think he'll attack, so he thinks we shall, so we must. Um, trying to sort through that and the logic inherent in that is, is a good way to get at some of the uh, uh, thinking associated with um, nuclear strategy during this period. A number of different strategies developed by the United States. Uh, one of the things I will do is place on the uh, CSI homepage uh, a five-page document called uh, Evol Evolution of U.S. Deterrent Strategies. And you'll find that under either uh, my name, Lieutenant Colonel Bassett, or uh, under a, a special section devoted exclusively to this course. Uh, and that will take you through the evolution of um, proposed and actually implemented U.S. Uh, nuclear deterrent strategies. Um, it's, um, uh, they change, and that's an important point to make during this period, that there's an evolution in uh, U.S. nuclear strategy. Uh, it is a, uh, these are strategies based on uh, uh, desire to exploit a perceived uh, advantage in technology. Uh, two great cases in that would be, uh, of that, would be the, uh, uh, the years immediately after World War II where the United States possesses nuclear weaponry, atomic weaponry, and uh, the Soviets don't. Another good case would be the 1980s and the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, Reagan's plan. Uh, another uh, source of change uh, would be uh, a desire to achieve more bang for the buck. Uh, central to the um, massive retaliation new look strategy adopted by the Eisenhower administration in the 1950s. Uh, a, uh, also driving change is uh, the desire to overcome uh, a perceived 
relative inferiority uh, in a particular capability. Uh, the growing fear in the late 1950s, something that the uh, Democrats exploit politically, that the Soviets are developing a nuclear capability uh, uh, in excess of ours, that there's a missile gap. Uh, that is causing a change and in influencing uh, our nuclear strategy. Uh, and also we see from time to time a desire to um, re-seize the initiative uh, and to become less reactive to Soviet capabilities, uh, to afford us more options. Which I think gets to another of the, of the four central points you might want to explore in this section of the lesson. And that is that there is an inherent tension between uh, nuclear strategy and conventional warfighting strategy. The notion that uh, early on, this belief that having nukes is going to render conventional warfare uh, unnecessary uh, or even obsolete. Uh, that is uh, going to become increasingly um, uh, attacked. It's one of the bases behind uh, uh, massive retaliation. Uh, Korea is going to show that uh, there will continue to be conventional warfare in the nuclear age. And we will see American strategists continuing to grapple with this whole idea of how best to fight uh, in, a, uh, in a world that uh, possesses nuclear weapons. One of the readings we have in 610 that you don't have in this course gets at some of the early limited war uh, theories and theorists. Um, that can still be discussed in this context and probably should. Um, what uh, is possible in the way of conventional warfare? Uh, what the use of conventional uh, war fighting to send a message uh, and to attain a political result. The idea that you can apply conventional forces uh, in a measured way, keep it limited uh, to trigger a political response uh, on the part of your enemy. Something that uh, will have disastrous consequences in Vietnam uh, and I would argue is relative uh, and relevant to uh, uh, our strategy making uh, even today. So I think those are four major items that you can uh, uh, explore with students during uh, this particular portion of the lesson. Uh, using the thesis posed by one of the lesson authors uh, or using a slide that uh, encapsulates or, or conveys an idea uh, very prominent at that particular time. Larry, do you have anything to add to? Uh, yeah, j just a couple of things. Um, I'll let you in on uh, some inside secrets here. Uh, we're doing these out of sequence, so we've already done the Korean War video. I was a part of that, and we do discuss limited war to a certain extent there. And uh, the fact there was no limited war theory before Korea, it comes out as a result of Korea, and then we'll take us right into Vietnam. So uh, uh, if you want some help, if you want to use limited war in this lesson, you might skip ahead and look at the Korean War video just for what little we offer on it there. Uh, secondly, in terms of making material available, and I've talked sort of jokingly about Gaddis, you'll write in and somebody else will send you a copy. Uh, I'm speaking from an outline uh, which has a little more detail than I, I, I gave you as fast as I tried to talk uh, about the development, origins and development of the Cold War. Be happy to put that on the home page as well. And uh, anybody who wants to call in or write uh, to discuss these things in more detail, be happy to do that. But bottom line, I would suggest not only this, looking at this outline, but uh, the Gaddis article I mentioned, getting that as an overview for the Cold War, and the Ken and X article, which is in, the, uh, I think it's June or July uh, issue of Foreign Affairs 1947. It's a famous article. We have copies of it here, too. We can send it uh, to you along with Gaddis. Um, but those materials uh, will be available, and I think would be helpful uh, in uh, uh, drawing together some of the points I made earlier on, and, and you as well. Um, okay. The. Uh, point about perception, I think, is critical. Uh, we find it uh, in the case of. Uh, uh, the Korean War, we talk about it in great detail during the video there, how we misperceived, or they misperceived our view of Korea. 
to the point where they thought they could intervene without any U.S. response, they found out they were wrong. We misperceived how sensitive they were about us crossing the 38th parallel. I mean, that's just at the conventional war level. You escalate up to nuclear, nuclear strategy, perceptions uh, have uh, very dire uh, consequences. And what you were getting at with that statement about we think they will, they shall, you know, et cetera. Uh, if you want to see this on video, go rent World War III with Rock Hudson and Brian Keith, because that's exactly the way the world would go. It isn't that a madman would push the button. It's that one side thinks the other has to attack, and therefore we have to push the button. The other side, knowing that they're about to do that, they have to push it, either th even though neither side wants to. Uh, figure the logic out. The logic is there. It's very logical. Fortunately, we never got to that point. Uh, we came close in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, a book I looked at last night indicated Khrushchev was ready to use nuclear weapons to defend uh, Cuba if we invaded. We came two days, to, uh, within two days of invading Cuba. Very close. But uh, this whole idea of perception is reality. It's uh, not what the other side actually thinks, it's what you think they think is critical. We, uh, many of the history lessons we give, we're assuming we know what the other person thought, et cetera, et cetera. That's generally not the case. Oftentimes we didn't have a clue any more than they had a clue about what we were thinking, and that makes for a very dangerous uh, world. Uh, final section here, we'll just mention a few topics uh, following, again, the origins and development of the Cold War, nuclear strategy. Uh, follow, uh, last section, uh, or last piece of material you might want to look at is simply the role of the military in the nuclear age, uh, in, in an age when uh, it looks more and more as we get into it, we won't be using atomic weapons. Uh, World War III may, may not, probably will not come about. What then are we going to do? Uh, that has to be uh, determined, and uh, it, not only that, uh, the role of each service, but also just simply how they're going to be organized, how they're going to operate. There are all sorts of issues that come out of World War II uh, that have to be dealt with, uh, not just the atomic bomb, but also the organization and functioning of the military. Just briefly, one issue is unification. Uh, the idea is to get the services together, what today we call purple. Every, uh, the services will vanish as individual services. You'll have an amalgamation, except Secretary of Navy James Forsell says no. That isn't the way it's going to be. We'll surrender some of our sovereignty to an overall organization, but it'll be more federal. We'll retain our distinct identities as services. And he wins that debate. The 1947 right. uh, law sets up the national military establishment, not the Department of Defense, but the national military establishment, the NME. And it's a federal organization. Uh, you get a new department, Department of the Air Force, to go with the Department of the Army and Department of the Navy, and you get a Secretary of Defense who has very little power vis-a-vis -vis these other departments, has very little power over the budget or, or in terms of coordinating uh, uh, the military uh, strategy and approach. Uh, Truman, realizing that, decided, well, it's payback time. The first Secretary of Defense will be James Forrestal. Let him deal with the monster he created. And the result of that is Forrestal by and 49 has, in, in 49 has a nervous breakdown and uh, commits suicide. Uh, the next Secretary of Defense will be Lewis Johnson, who's more or less a non-entity, uh, uh, except from the Navy's point of view, when he cuts a supercarrier. And uh, then George Marshall becomes Secretary of Defense, which uh, wasn't supposed to happen. A military man is secretary, but Congress passes the uh, necessary legislation and, and so forth. But uh, uh, in 1949, the National Military uh, establishment uh, is given the name the Department of Defense. The, the Secretary of Defense is given a little more power than he had under the NME, but still it's federal. The separate uh, services will retain their identity. They will not be amalgamated. Uh, another issue dealt with at the time in the legislation of 47, uh, you have the CIA established to collect intelligence, a central intelligence agency. That's the idea, make it centralized. Uh, the National Security Council, which will coordinate coordinate foreign policy, uh, uh, the statutory members, well, I'm getting in trouble here, but essentially the president will oversee it, but you'll have the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Director, Director of the CIA, I believe is a statutory member, but don't quote me on it. But the point is you have the key foreign policy figures in one group, and their purpose is to coordinate among themselves. 
The problem is it doesn't always work that way, but uh, that's the idea of the National Security Council. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, which had uh, been put into existence during World War II as a means to have some counter to the uh, British Chiefs of Staff uh, in what turned out to be the Combined Chiefs of Staff, uh, the Joint Chiefs never had any legal basis. The President just set them up. Uh, in 47, you get the statutory uh, basis for the Joint Chiefs. They, uh, they, they are now a uh, legal, or, well, I shouldn't say that because it implies they were illegal before, but they, they now have uh, laws that, uh, a law that creates them and a chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Over time, the chairman will assume more power, but he doesn't have it necessarily at the beginning. Um, and as we said already, the Air Force has a separate service. Uh, later in the decade, you get by executive order the integration of the armed services. And this is a major issue, but it's not one we go into great detail here. And um, uh, it's done, as I said, by executive order. Uh, civil rights, integration, all of that is a very hot political issue in the 1940s and into the 50s. And as it pertains to the military, uh, integration could be imposed by the president. He didn't have to have Congress to integrate the military. So he did so. Truman uh, signed the executive order for the integration of the military. The main uh, obstacle among the services was the Army, more than the Air Force and Navy in terms of integration. But they accepted it and uh, moved ahead. Um, and then finally, uh, looking at the Army uh, in the nuclear age, the question was, what would it do? We deal with this a little bit in the Korean War video. But uh, if the atomic bomb, if the next war is going to involve atomic bombs, what role will the Army play? Uh, they can't deliver atomic bombs. That's a question for the uh, uh, Air Force or the Navy, who duke it out, and uh, the, uh, the Air Force wins uh, when the supercarrier is canceled. So the Air Force will deliver the nuclear weapons. The Air Force is getting most of the bucks in a very constrained environment physically. And uh, uh, the Army, it's assumed, will not have much of a role to play, except to go in and clean up afterwards. Uh, Korea comes along, and that changes. You have a limited war. We're not going to fight World War III over Korea. We're not going to allow uh, nucle nuclear weapons to be used. Uh, it's, uh, therefore, the, but on the other hand, we will have to fight for it, and that's the job the Army has to do. We use air power and naval power to begin with. It's not enough, so the Army is sent in. And the, uh, the money funnel opens up. And uh, the, uh, not only does the Army get well, everybody else does. And the defense budget hits 50, around $50 billion, going from 14 to 50 uh, during the Korean War. But uh, as soon as the war is over, and Eisenhower, uh, during the presidency of uh, Eisenhower, five-star general, he cuts the military to the quick, arguing that to continue to spend $50 billion a year will cause inflation, and we can lose the Cold War uh, through uh, the economic demise of the United States just as easily as through the military demise. So he cuts back you have, uh, the military. You have the, the spectacle of a five-star general as president cutting, gutting the military, and especially the Army, which his former colleagues, Galvin, uh, Ridgeway, uh, Taylor especially, cannot understand. And they begin to challenge this, quote, new look, uh, putting uh, most of your eggs in the nuclear basket uh, as, as a deterrent and arguing that what if another Korea comes along? We have no way to meet it if we don't have the Army. It'll be another Task Force Smith. And uh, this debate goes on into uh, the late 50s, at which point Eisenhower begins to open it up a little. And then with Kennedy, you get flexible response. And the, uh, uh, the money goes, uh, or you spend much more on defense. The defense budget goes up, and the Army is modernized, et cetera. In the meantime, however, the Army was trying to keep its hand in during the 50s, during Eisenhower. The way they chose to do it was through what was called the Pentomic Division. And the reading by uh, Doty gets into that as our, uh, in, in terms of what it's, how it was organized, how it was set up, what it was designed to do, which was to fight on a nuclear battlefield. Five battle groups to a division spread out uh, in a checkerboard fashion. So if a, a tactical nuke took out one, you'd still have four left. Well, what it did, of course, was create an unwieldy span of control. Uh, there were all sorts of other problems inherent with it, not, uh, not the least of which was the tactical nukes. You had the Davy Crockett, which was a, uh, uh, an individually launched nucle nuclear projectile. Uh, uh, the problem was the, the radius of the blast was greater than the distance you could lob it. So the, the joke was the Davy Crockett kit was uh, the missile 
and a pair of tennis shoes. Uh, the pentomic division didn't work, and uh, by the early 60s, they're getting back to triangular divisions, uh, ROAD. And I'd uh, like to end my comments on this note, and that is we've given you a lot of material for this lesson. I would argue if you can get through the development of the Cold War up to Vietnam, nuclear strategy up to Vietnam, and these changes in organization and force structure and uh, the service roles up to Vietnam, that would probably be enough for this lesson. Then next, the next lesson you'd start with specific examples, Korea, the following, following that you do get Vietnam, and then you can bring in more of the context after that. But uh, for this lesson, if you're pressed for time, I would shoot for getting it up to Vietnam. And that can be easily done in uh, all three of these categories. The origins, development of the Cold War, nuclear strategy, and simply the role of the military. I guess the last, uh, last couple things I'd say would be um, um, many of us find it useful uh, where possible throughout the course to, um, to ask a question or, or develop discussion uh, that asks students to um, compare and contrast or uh, what we're looking at in that particular period with uh, challenges we face today and in the future. Or uh, maybe ask the question, is anything we are looking at in this lesson useful to us uh, as uh, we negotiate our way through Force 21 and take the Army into the 21st century? I think a couple of ways that can be done in this particular lesson um, and uh, in the third portion of the lesson, the post-war defense structure, uh, a couple of questions I ask students uh, in the course are, um, Several historians have noted similarities between what the U.S. military went through immediately after World War II and what we are going through now uh, following the Cold War, with the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, do you see similarities? Uh, and what are the similar trends? And I think you could, you could talk about things like uh, following victory in two major wars, there's been a significant reassessment of the U.S. role in foreign affairs, and that will have consequences for the military. Uh, U.S. with a significant technological advantage, uh, if uh, maybe momentary. In the case of uh, post-World War II, the nuke, uh, today all the talk about information age technologies and the advantages that will uh, afford U.S. forces. Um, then as now, a reassessment in service roles and missions, a number of uh, purple uh, initiatives to make us more joint and more interoperable. Uh, we're going through force reductions and limited fiscal resources, just like uh, the services were in the late 40s. Uh, and then uh, maybe less so today, but nevertheless there, there continue to be, uh, there continues to be inter-service rivalry for uh, uh, resources. Uh, and that's playing as well. So those are some things that maybe can be developed in uh, discussion. Uh, and the same thing can be done with the pen pentomic division. Uh, ask the question, does the pentomic experiment in the late 1950s uh, offer any in insights relevant to our Force 21 experience today? Uh, such as, uh, are there problems associated with um, exploring capabilities and basing doctrine and capabilities on equipment and technologies identified but not yet fielded in numbers? Um, continued uh, questions about adequacy of uh, strategic left, uh, lift. Um, the point Doty makes in his article about intellectual adaptation, getting officers to buy into the new doctrine and the new system for fighting. Uh, a problem in the late 1950s, uh, arguably uh, a problem for us today and in the future as we uh, uh, implement and continue to move forward in Force 21. Um, and then what Doty might suggest, uh, the danger to near-term preparedness in implementing uh, a new doctrine and uh, organization. Uh, do students see any problems uh, associated with that? So I think these are a couple things you can do, and, and it, it does get student, it develops student uh, interest uh, to try and uh, see relevance to what we face today and in the future with what we're looking at in a particular lesson. Right. Um, and without the search for relevance, it all becomes rather academic and 
uninteresting except from a uh, you know, storytelling standpoint. So second that, and uh, you know, thank you very much. Again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me, Larry Yates, or Lieutenant Colonel Bill Bassett uh, regarding uh, these lessons, and uh, hope you found this useful.